Welcome everyone, bienvenue. Thank you everyone for coming to the 53rd event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill, and the organizer of this series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications and Technology Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. We posted four virtual events this winter, and you can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL, disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, and more. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Sen to introduce himself and his uh, group. <laughs> yeah, on behalf of Machine Agencies, working the Machine Agencies Working Group at Concordia University at the Milieu Institute, um, we're really happy to welcome Alex Ketchum to thank uh, Docs, or Alex Hanna and thank Alex <laughs> Ketchum, confusion there, for the opportunity to collaborate. Um, at Machine Agencies, Machine agencies would continue to build a research culture and community exploring the relations and agencies between humans and machine intelligence. And we're really happy to support the series, which I think has been so wonderful in bringing together the Montreal community. And it's a real privilege to be able to continue to count as our collaborators and partners, uh, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing Communications and Technology Speaker Series and Workshop Series. It's really great to be able to support this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, for that. Thank you for your support of so many of our events. Um, so for everyone in attendance, I just want to let you know for this event, recording is enabled, so the event can be embedded on our website. But don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available. So throughout the event, you might you can choose to type your questions in the Q&A box below, um, and there will be some time at the end of the event for Dr. Alex Hanna to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful to the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Kim. Past series speakers Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the lands that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. The series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. Both McGill and Concordia are currently located in Jojobe, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by Indigenous communities, such as the Westalorn people at the Innisgoden camp, water protectors, and people involved in land back movements make clear the ever present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved Black and Indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. As last week's speaker, Dr. Max Lee Poulon, writes in their book, Pollution is Colonialism, to change, I guess it was two weeks ago, but we were on rights in their book, to change colonial land relations and enact other types of land relations requires specificity. So with those words, I encourage you to learn more about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for beginning. I'm going to turn it over again to Fenwick to introduce Dr. Alex Hanna. Well, thank you so much. And I'll just say a few words about Dr. Alex Hanna, who is, we're so delighted to have and, and welcome virtually to Montreal, although hopefully someday in the future, actually a physical trip to Montreal is must, definitely in order. Uh, Dr. Alex Hanna is the newly appointed Director of Research of the Distributed AI Research Institute. A sociologist by training, her work centers on data used in new computational technologies in the ways in which these data exacerbate racial, gender, and class inequity. She also works in the areas of social movements, focusing on the dynamics of anti-racist campus actions in the United States and Canada. Dr. Hanna has published widely in top tier venues across the social sciences, including the journals Mobilization, American Behavioral Scientist, and Big Data in Society, and top tier computer science conferences such as CSCW, FACT, and NeurIPS. Dr. Hanna serves as co chair of Sociologists for Trans Justice, as well as a senior fellow at the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. FAST Company included Dr. Hanna as part of their 
2021 Queer 50, and she has been featured in the Cal Academy of Sciences New Science Exhibit, which features queer and trans scientists of color. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Alex Hanna for the speaker and presentation today. Thank you all so much. Thank you for that really kind introduction, um, Drs. Nicole V and Ketchum. Um, um, in terms of where I reside, I'm in the East Bay in California, or unceded Ohlone land, um, and um, pairing action with um, acknowledgement of land acknowledgement if one is in the um, Bay Area. And call the San Francisco Bay Area. I encourage you to contribute, pay your annual Shumi land tax um, some, as, as, as basically a, a, a minimum of action um, acknowledging um, um, the stolen land on which um, we all reside on Turtle Island. Um, the name of the talk, let me go ahead and share my slides. Um, um, Great. So the name of my talk today is Beyond Bias, Algorithmic Unfairness, Infrastructures, and Genealogies of Data. Um, it's a research agenda that I've been working on for the past several years with many, many collaborators uh, uh, with whom I'm very thankful to work. Um, and I hope to give you a kind of a sense of what the work is today and, and, and really looking forward to discussing it much more um, and direction in which we plan to go after today. Uh, with that, uh, I have a threefold agenda. First, talking about algorithmic unfairness, then data structures infrastructure, and then lastly, talking more at length about the research pro program around genealogies of data. So many of you in, in the room probably have heard the story, but uh, if you haven't, um, it kind of starts with um, this, uh, this narration by Joy Bolognini, uh, now Dr. Joy Bolognini, um, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League. When she started her doctor or her master's work at uh, MIT, she was starting to work with these facial analysis algorithms in which she would allow it to scan her face and, um, and, and, and was trying to get it to scan her face, but it couldn't scan her face. Um, and trying to understand how facial analysis algorithms could work uh, for different individuals, and especially individuals like her, dark skin, um, as you can see, she's a dark skin black woman. It wasn't until she put this mask, this little white mask on that this facial analysis tool was able to actually uh, scan her face or actually detect her face. So uh, as she said here, kind of echoing uh, uh, Fanon, in my case, a white mask was a closer fit to what the system has learned was a face than my actual human face. So, um, so Joy and, and uh, Dr. Bolomini, as well as um, the uh, executive director, and happy to say my now my colleague again, Dr. Tanid Tabru, uh, wrote a paper uh, or developed an, uh, kind of an auditing methodology on um, these different facial analysis algorithms that are um, developed commercially. So they developed a pilot parliament's benchmark data set out of publicly available uh, images of, of, of legislators in um, a number of different countries. And um, they, were, they were doing this in such a way where it had a, a wide range of, um, of, of, of skin tones. And then, but they also were restricting um, the genders of individuals to binary gender. And what they did is they developed it, um, um, this kind of auditing exercise where they were assessing how well um, these algorithms were doing um, against this data set. And so in a, until you probably imagine um, when the paper came out, there was this huge gap um, between uh, white, uh, the, the palest men and the darker skin women. So this is a, a well-known thing, um, kind of disparities in this way. I highlight this because I want to talk about other examples here and talk about where the interventions lie when we talk about this, because this is sort of a canonical case when we talk about bias in learning, machine learning systems. The second case is this paper that was uh, written by a number of people at Facebook AI Research um, in which they were assessing how well different commercial object recognition systems were doing on images from around the world. And so what they did is that they developed a similar sort of audit strategy where they took this data set called the Dollar Tree data set 
a dollar street data set, not dollar tree, I'm sorry, um, that is a store, dollar street data set in which there are the images from different um, countries in the world. Um, and they were, uh, for the different images, they collected these household incomes from the houses in which they took the images. And so what they uh, basically did, and they found, you probably could imagine in the same kind of vein, um, there were these images of things like this image on the left, soap in uh, Nepal, uh, where the income of this household was 288 US dollars. Uh, and the common classifications were food, cheese, dish, what cooking. On the right, you see much more closer to the ground truth label. Okay. It's not quite surprising because where most, most of these data come from tend to be large image data sets used for both training and evaluation. And they mostly come from places in the global north. Um, the US and Western Europe with trace kinds of samples from, um, from the African continent, um, from, uh, from, the, from the Indian subcontinent, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, um, East Asia. Uh, and then uh, you can see on the bottom right in this graph, this, you see the distribution of people in the world is very different. So there's sort of a limited intervention you can think about on this, or you can think about a much broader type of intervention. Because companies are companies, they mostly went with a sort of limited intervention. They said, well, what we need effectively is we need kind of auditing methodologies that are going to be amenable to a large variation of faces. IBM released their diversity in faces data set to actually studying fairness in facial recognition systems. You know, withhold your own, your, your, whatever you think about facial recognition systems, I personally think they should be abolished. Um, but even thinking about the fairness of these systems, they released this to say, okay, we have this large amount of variation of these systems. The ugly underbelly of this is that these systems are often developed without the consent of those in the images or they're scraped from the web with very little consideration of, of, of uh, things like copyright, data subject rights, and so on. This is akin to modes of inclusion that are unethical extraction uh, and extractive. What Louise Seamstra has called uh, predatory inclusion uh, in, in, in uh, student, uh, student loan debt. And Kianga Yahama Taylor has also used that terminology in talking about um, housing and mortgages. The discourses of inclusion can actually be uh, much of the time obscure or hinder progress to more ethical data use. As Anna Lauren Hoffman has put it, inclusion operationalizes the language of remorse and doing better to obscure its commitment to a substantive techno-rationalist conception of the future. And for this, we kind of follow this, this theme that comes from Aaron Plastic, the historian of science, where he says, if we're going to actually begin studying biases in machine learning training system data, we actually need histories of the data sets themselves. Understanding and intervening in the harms of these systems requires interrogating the histories of these data sets. And for me, in our project, that includes the data practices, values, and assumptions embedded in data sets themselves. With that, the stage is set. I want to move on to the second part of the talk, which is data sets as infrastructure. And for this, I want to talk about a particular data set, and that data set is ImageNet. Image that's going to be a running example in this talk, and because it's sort of paradigmatic, and we'll talk about why. The ImageNet data set was developed by a team of researchers at Princeton and Stanford to support research and development into visual object recognition. Consisting of over 14 million images and organized into about 20,000 categories, at the time of its creation, it was one of the largest human annotated image data sets ever developed, and has orders of magnitude larger than its predecessors. Its immediate predecessor is Pascal VOC, which only had 20,000 images in 20 categories. Its progenitor, or one of the main progenitors, Fei Fei Li, called it um, a, an effort to map out the entire world of objects. ImageNet is often credited with leading to the emergence of modern deep learning, which is kind of the uh, flavor of AI and, and machine learning that's used in nearly every computer vision. NLP, reinforcement learning, et cetera, system in operation today, both in the research and industry context. More specifically, the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Challenge, or more colloquially known as the ImageNet Challenge, was a classification task in which a machine learning algorithm had to accurately classify 1.5 million images 
which bound to 1,000 distinct categories. And so seeking to facilitate wider adoption of ImageNet, the team organized the ImageNet Challenge, which was an annual, annual competition running from 2010 to 2017, they have established the data set as a benchmark against which to evaluate latest algorithms in image in computer vision, mainly in classification, but also in uh, object local localization, in which um, the algorithms had to find where in the image this item was. And you can see this inflection point in 2012 with this, uh, with this algorithm called AlexNet. Uh, no relation. Um, this was developed by uh, three computer scientists at the University of Toronto, Alex Krasinski, Ilya Sitzkever, and Jeffrey Hinton. Um, and so this really inaugurated the use of these types of algorithms, in this case, convolutional neural networks, um, and thereby inaugurating the era of modern machine learning, or what's been called a deep learning era. And this inflection point, you can, as you can see, you have this graph released by the OpenAI Research Institute, shows that the amount of compute uh, needed to train these models increased uh, dramatically in these past years. And this is actually an aged uh, graph now. We had things like um, GPT-2 and 3 uh, and the kind of trillion parameter models, it would be off the graph right now. Um, so this is, this, is, this is actually getting quite dated. It's really hard to overstate the importance of this paper. Published in 2012, um, the paper by Krasinski and colleagues uh, Sutzkever, who's now co-founder and chief scientist at OpenAI, and Jeff Hinton, uh, emeritus at Toronto, and currently engineering um, fellow at Google, as well as um, the 2018 winner of Computer Science Highest Honor the Turing Award. Um, this, this paper now, I think it, this, I updated this maybe three months ago, it had about 80,000 citations. Um, and it's really oriented the entire field towards uh, this, this deep learning. And so ImageNet itself has become this very paradigmatic uh, case. But when we start digging into the person subclass of ImageNet, things become weird very quickly. So the GIF on the right reveals a mapping of arcane, racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, and frankly bizarre image categories mapped to real images straight from the web. In a deep archaeology of the data set called Excavating.ai, researcher Kate Crawford and artist Trevor Pagelin do a deep dive into the ontology of image that's person subclass. They find, amongst other things, categories like Ball Buster, which features images of women with no unifying theme, Bonds winner, Bonds babe, Closet Queen, Drug Addict or Junkie, Failure, Loser, Non Starter, Jezebel, Mistress or Cup Woman, Second Raider, and Wimp, Chicken or Cry Baby. There's a bizarre relationship from nouns to images within WordNet, namely the assumption that nearly all words have some kind of physical or imageable relationship to images which exist in the world. There is, of course, no reason to believe that um, the relationship between images and their meanings is complex, mutated, and complicated. As Crawford and Paglin state in the weird metaphysics of ImageNet, there are separate image categories for assistant professor and associate professor, as though if someone were to get a promotion, their biometric signature would reflect the change in rank. The ontology of ImageNet descends from a much earlier project. ImageNet's category roots can be traced to that of WordNet, a project created by psychologists in the mid 80s to attempt to create a hierarchical ontology of many words in the English language. WordNet creates sin sets, categories of words uh, into which words can be placed. The authors of ImageNet utilize WordNet and then ask crowd workers on Amazon's mechanical search to search the words on Google image search and other, and other image searches and create them into what will become ImageNet. It was the only way to create such a large data set at scale um, at the level of an academic lab. Crawford and Paglin didn't stop with the archaeology of ImageNet. In a well-publicized example, they trained their own model using the deep learning framework CAFE on the ImageNet person category and uh, released a tool called ImageNet Roulette. The tool spread quickly through Twitter and Facebook, being written about in tech press and beyond. While many of the categories proved humorous or, or curious, many were naturally offensive, racist, and sexist. Journalist Julia Carey Wong wrote about how the ImageNet called her a racist slur. Uh, while New York Times editor Jamal Jordan was consistently labeled um, with terms like black, black person, or Negro. 
So what are the implications when the cutting edge methods of AI are trained, tested, and validated on data sets such as these? It's not even a requirement that a vision model be trained on image set to have the delirious downstream effects. As we saw in the example of Alexnet, methods which are based on these data sets have rhetorical and institutional weight, constructing more and more accepted black boxes in the Latorian sense upon which modern AI infrastructure is being progressively built. And moreover, I don't talk about it in this talk, but a lot of things that are being done is that a lot of the weights are the um, pre-trained layers in, in, in these large network, um, large, um, um, uh, uh, large models um, actually use things like ImageNet as, as pre-training layers because training these models is so expensive. But I don't really talk about that in this talk. Um, we can talk about that in the Q&A. There's some really interesting work on that too. So we think about data sets um, as infrastructure in four different ways. So in a paper that Emily Denton, Razana Ronesi, Andy Smart, Hillary Nicole, and Morgan Klaus Sharman and I wrote for an ICML workshop, we think about data sets as infrastructure um, in several different ways. At the most local and ob uh, mo most obvious and localized level, training data sets and benchmark data sets determine what a resulting machine learning model learns how problems are framed and what solutions are prioritized. Statistical properties of a data set determine category boundaries and who and what is rendered legible by a downstream model. Furthermore, label data sets organized by a particular categorical schema frequently subsume modeling decisions regarding the conceptualization, operationalization, and measurement of target variables for downstream classification tasks, and data sets themselves frequently embed metrics of success. In the case of ImageNet, the specific social practices of photography, of sharing images on the web, um, and it, they give rise to a particular view of the world that sees hammerhead charts as objects of scientific inquiry, trout as dead trophies, and lobsters primarily as food. And this comes from a, uh, an article, an excellent article at the Photographer's Gallery written by Nicholas Villeneuve. Second, data sets play a significant role in benchmarking AI algorithms. Benchmark data sets uh, are recognized as go-to standards for evaluation and comparison, and they often take on an authoritative role in the community. Improvements on performance metrics are associated, associated with benchmarks become synonymous with progress in the subfield. And data sets that have achieved such an authoritative status also play a unique and powerful, powerful role in structuring uh, research agendas and values within machine learning subfields. And so in the case of, of ImageNet, after, um, after uh, um, uh, the uh, win by Krasinski, uh, Sutskever, and in, in Hinton in 2012, convolutional neural networks became de jure in, in the ImageNet competition. So much so we see this reduction in error, error rate just go down and down, almost, almost reaching zero um, by um, 2015 because, because it becomes a dominant method and it really changes um, the research program and what machine learning looks like. Third, because data sets and their, authority, and their associated benchmarks take on this authoritarian nature within machine learning, they take the status of the model organism within laboratory studies. Um, here we're building on this work, uh, science, this, this volume, Science Without Laws, um, edited by Krieger et al, as well as this, um, this volume by um, Fuller on, on Drosphilia. Um, in genetics, in, uh, genetic research. The characteristics of the model organism are pragmatic. They're readily available, easy to manipulate, and somewhat uncomplicated in form. However, the cheapness and availability of the model organism also opens itself up to a set of conceptual and empirical gaps. Data sets and authoritative benchmarks then with their contingent collection processes, annotation and archival practices become a standard for much more complicated data traces and machine learning tasks. And that's pretty true. I'm able to import all this stuff. Uh, when we go into TensorFlow, which is one of the major deep learning frameworks, the one developed by Google, um, you can load an ImageNet with two lines, um, and you can load in the ImageNet weights um, uh, of the network in uh, what's called ResNet 50, which is a, a particular uh, model um, with two lines as well. Um, fourthly and finally, publicly available research acts as an infrastructure um, by providing the methodological backbone of how AI tools are deployed in industry contexts. The boundary between research and practice is then pliable as AI researchers flip between academia and industry. 
And you can read this on another excellent piece on this by Meredith Whitaker in AC and Transactions. It's just called the Steep Cost of Capture, in which he talks about this, this, um, this sort of dimension, this kind of uh, permeability between uh, big AI research labs and universities. Accordingly, that research that fo follows them into industry and enters into commercial products. Most technology companies derive value from the amount and kind of data they collect, and those data are much larger than those publicly available in research data sets. However, these shifts are conceptualized by, um, by shifts in scale, rarely in kind. So data sets perform an infrastructural function by undergirding the material research needs upon which commercial AI is also built and deployed. And so you can see this kind of methodology in, in, in the one article that describes a, a Google a proprietary Google data set called JFT 300, um, which kind of scales up the image set ontology um, from uh, 15 million images to 300 million images. And, this, and I'm sure this is published in 2017. So uh, I'm sure there's um, data sets which with much, much more internally. The last part of this talk, I want to, I guess the last half of this talk, I want to focus much more on the research agenda for actually studying this genealogy of data. To accomplish that, we split our research agenda into four main questions. First, how do data set developers actually describe and motivate the decisions that go into the creation of those data sets? For this, what we did is we focused on um, looking at a sample of different data sets used in computer vision. In a paper that we published at CSCW, Morgan Koshariman, Emily Denton, and I analyzed 113 different computer vision data sets in their papers, websites, and other documentation included in them. We took this out of, out of uh, what we had as a population of nearly, um, nearly um, uh, 700. Am I doing this map right? About 500 data sets. Sorry, we had a few other additions. Um, 500 different data sets that we defined, and we took a, um, a sample of these, a stratified sample, um, really matching in terms of the citation means and the, the year. Um, and this is minus the top 14 papers that we also uh, included. We also we coded them for 104 different variables, um, both qualitative and quantitative nature. We asked, is the main contribution the data set? Does the data contain images of real humans? Do the authors explain explicit ethical considerations of either the collection or the use of the data set? And then we also coded thematically those variables, um, those, quantit those qualitative variables, including the motivation for their creation, ethical considerations, and value values and value-leading terms. So analyzing some of the initial questions about this, we wanted to look at just how much of the papers here were dedicated to describing the data set. And we actually find about this kind of bimodal distribution here. Well, about 20% of the data sets fully dedicate text to describing the data sets. The majority of the documentation dedicates 50% or less of the text to describing them. This really indicates that there's a much more of a bias towards doing model work rather than data work in the work of AI. And this, um, this result's been confirmed by interview work performed by um, Google researcher Nithya Santabasi and others. We also find that data sets are not really built for longevity or reproducibility. Following in the work of library of computer science, uh, scientists Victoria Stodden, uh, Christine Borgman, and others, we find that data sets are really difficult to find, to download, and rarely are hosted on an institutional repository. So for instance, of the data set papers that we find, we had 114 papers. We split ImageNet into two constituent papers because they all they had very different information. Um, of, the, uh, of the 114 papers, only 69 have a URL with access to the data set the paper. If they had a website at all, we had to that we searched, we uh, uh, found 90, 97 of them. Um, of um, those websites in the papers, only 46 of them are still available. Of the 80 paper, uh, 80 um, that we found um, uh, any kind of URL on, the only 59 had the data still downloadable. Only three had a DOI. Um, most of them um, information or the data set was hosted on a personal or lab website. 
and only one of them was hosted at an institutional repository. Um, we also looked into the different kinds of privacy institutional board review or ethical consideration sections. And this is pretty notable because NeurIPS, one of the largest machine learning conferences, um, has uh, actually now had a, instituted a ethical review process for all of its papers. Uh, five of the 100 data sets containing human subjects mentioned using an IRB. Um, five of the 100 data sets containing human subjects discussed having privacy implications, and zero include an ethical consideration section. And you can imagine, I mean, these are data sets that are ranging from being published I mean, from year, anywhere from the year 2000 um, to 2020. In our qualitative results, we find four main themes. Um, and when we think about our themes, we focus on texts that really talk about what kind of values were embedded in discussion with these papers. And so we found four trade-offs. First, data set authors value efficiency, both in terms of the time, um, the time spent and the associated cost, monetarily and computationally of gathering and annotating data. So authors sought desirable properties in terms of objective, unbiased, neutral, and comprehensive data data that are easily available, quickly and cheaply classifiable, and then able to quickly but accurately be annotated. The value of efficiency was clear. Contrast that to the principles of care, which data sets could be attentive to. Valuing efficiency was at the cost of care, valuing slow and thoughtful decision-making and data processes, considering more ethical ways to collect data and treat annotators and seeking fair compensation, or even reporting compensation itself for data labor which most uh, articles did not report compensation. Second, data sets valued universality in lieu of contextuality. We found that these data set creators valued large scale diverse and realistic data that lent a belief in the inherent comprehensiveness or complete categorical classifications of real world phenomena. Universality was embraced at the expense of contextuality. How circumstances such as time, location, or use shape the world and thus the data in the data set. Um, was not really effective. So for instance, language employed to classify objects with people data sets were not attended to. Any kind of locality was not attended to. Why specific identity markers were chosen for representing diversity was also absent. And Morgan's also done some great work focusing on that in um, specifically facial analysis data sets. Third, we found that the universe of data was often highly constrained to a specific and partial worldview. Data set authors strive for impartiality on behalf of the data collectors, often the authors themselves and their annotators. They seek a de-biasing of human subjectivity, such that data is unbiased or implicitly more trustworthy. Data set authors did not report their own positionality, such as how one's social and professional position can give rise to differential resources and knowledge gaps. And then lastly, despite the fact that many authors posited that data was crucial, many pieces of data collection and curation processes are missing from the documentation, including often the data itself. Reporting and evaluation of the model work is what was typically incentivized rather than the careful, slow data work. And that, and that matches the kind of uh, characterizations by some of us and others. So second, we wanted to understand the histories and continuing conditions of the creation of specific benchmark data sets. If we're going wide in the first paper, we wanted to go deep in the second paper. And so what we ended up focusing on was ImageNet once again. ImageNet was to be developed as a training and benchmarking tool for computer vision practitioners. Um, yet the impacts of the data sets creation extend far beyond the materiality of the data set itself in the subfield of computer vision. It really set the tone on how machine learning research is done in the modern era. And so a paper that Emily Denton, uh, Roswell M. Ronesi, Andy Smart, Hillary Nicole and I wrote and published in Big Data Society, we focused on analyzing the discourses around ImageNet and understanding what was being spoken about by ImageNet's progenitors, as well as um, both in papers, as well as talks, and also what other people have also said about ImageNet um, in, 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 um, in other kinds of proximate um, data sets which have been released since then, including NS Coco uh, and a few others. 
We mostly had three findings in this paper. Three things really emerged. First, the implications of the mode of image network, especially the data, data work really emerged. Um, in this, we call this the unreasonable effectiveness of data. And, and, and I kind of like to talk about this as a type of ideology of data accumulation. Kind of the intellectual and ideational sub um, superstructure upon the data capital uh, uh, base structure. Um, the creation of parallel image sets of X has become the standard mode of doing research in the field of computer vision beyond. So for instance, in this slide from a talk by Fei Fei Li, she talks about parallel image sets of X as being the deeper mode of doing research in, in, in machine learning. Uh, she presents space net, music net, medical image net, shape net, event net, activity net. Sebastian Ruder, who is at Google Research right now, asked in a, in a blog post um, at, um, at the Gradient, which is a machine learning blog, uh, has NLP or natural language processing image net uh, moment arrived. And he talks about this with a really large advent of huge different um, massive types of textual data sets, including common crawl in, in, in the pile, although the pile wasn't out there. Second, we find this kind of construction of this computational construction of meaning and understanding. Central to image net's epistemology is this, assume, is this assumed existence of an underlying and universal organization of the visual, of the visual world into clearly de demarcated concepts. And so we can trace this idea back to WordNet. Lee's understanding of the underlying aims of WordNet to organize hundreds of thousands of English words into a massive ontology directly inspired the creation of, of ImageNet. And, and um, Lee talks about this uh, chance meeting with Christine Feldbaum, who is the head of WordNet, and how there is direct, actual direct lineage of this in their, in their um, meeting at Princeton. So the relationship between images and their meanings is complicated and, 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 and complex with entire fields such as art history and media studies, structural semiotics, symbolic hermeneutics dedicated to the study in relation between objects and their representations. Yet the documentation and publications accompanying ImageNet do little work to motivate, justify, or analyze the relationship between WordNet categories and their accompanying images. Through this submission, ImageNet creator signaled that there's a this presumed self-evident relationship between WordNet nouns and the visual world. This act of, the act of recognition within this epistemology, whether by human or machine, is one of identification or verification of an underlying truth of what an image, uh, image depicts. And you can kind of see this, the way that Lee talks about the kind of processing of images. She talks about this study that she did earlier in her career by showing um, undergraduates pictures for 50, something like 500 milliseconds, and then asking them to describe them. Um, she said, I think, quote, you know, this wasn't complicated. You don't have to have a special kind of sight. She also has this very physicalist account of vision by tying, um, you know, this kind of theory of the Cambrian explosion, this kind of moment in the um, explosion of the diversity of evolution to the creation of the eye. Um, and so broader discourses surrounding image that further describe, suggest a problematization of image recognition that's rooted in this deep contextualized and non-situated physicalist account of human vision. By failing to account for the particularities of this view, particularities that are largely reflect a white Western male gaze and wielding this naturalistic rhetoric in popular scientific discourse, the, the subjective nature of meaning formation and presence of acts of unreflective interpretation is obfuscated in the from view. So in this sense, we understand ImageNet and the myriad of image data sets that have followed in its stead as a technical instantiation of Harway's God trick, the view that sees everything from nowhere. And this parallel is exemplified in the logo from Lee's Vision Lab, which is this really unsettling singular machine eye with a scalera made of sky and an iris made of a camera lens with this logo to build computers that see. Lastly, one of the major challenges of constructing ImageNet, according to Lee's account, was the verification of the vast amounts of data gathered from ImageNet, ImageNet search engines. 
These university undergrads were initially utilized for this task, but were quickly abandoned due to costs. Collaborator Jia Dang calculated that it would take 19 years to label the entire data set that way. Notably, undergrad work is subjected to interruptions, that's from the genomic signal factors such as funding, time of the school year, and training. And so they sought another solution in step in his own uh, mechanical Turk, a tool which, according to Lee, that could scale, which they could not possibly dream of by hiring kids and undergrads. And so Lee describes these affordances as a godsend, but doesn't really frame Turkers as individual uh, kind of contributors or contributors to the project. Um, it was that creators don't disclose how much the annotators were paid. They don't discuss which countries had the largest number of annotators, nor do they discuss any demographic characteristics of the annotators. Um, they realize this is generic human intelligence uh, in which they're doing these rote tasks, but they don't have any kind of measures of subjectivity. Um, in, in, in this kind of functional roteness, the infrastructural devaluation and abstract of the annotation task has not lost the image of its creators. In a slide deck from 2010, they asked themselves if they're exploiting chained prisoners with this work or something, uh, a piece of cartoon clip art of a veggie prisoner in a ball and chains. Um, and you can kind of see this, you know, in the parallel of, of working conditions that have been um, shown, um, you know, in terms of, of people who are doing work on Turkers. Um, um, Willie Roddy, of course, um, and M. Six Silverman, and their work on and their work on development of Turkopticon, and the organizers of Turkopticon. And here, I want to give a shout out to um, um, Sherry and Crystal from Turkopticon as as fantastic organizers who are still organizing um, and, and organizing uh, campaigns um, with Turkopticon these days. Um, I'd love to talk more about those campaigns in Q and A. The ImageNet creators framed the MTurk workers as heroes without whom the data set could not have come into being. Um, but the hero's existence is not defined historically by their technical path capacity of completing anonymous tasks or their actions of, 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 of the purpose of transforming the human condition. Um, in reality, mechanical Turk workers are not only unnamed as individual beings, but from the standpoint of oppressors, um, they're Kind of face as being subjected to generic tasks, you know, and and this is really comes through when you read accounts from Turkers or other crowd workers that um, you know lots of their work gets thrown away um, if if it doesn't meet some bar or um, can be universally rejected, and a lot of that's changed since um, the development of the internet. But there's many many kind of asymmetric relations in the in the Turker professor relationship, especially in research AI. And so if the cutting edge of AI is built by the heroes of named progenitors, it's only because of the labor of annotators who exist beyond the halls of academia and industry. And so artist Mimi Anuha turns this construction on its head by rendering the mundane, crowded home workplaces of crowded image annotators as sites of heroism, illustrating rumpled couches, crowded kitchen tables, and home office desks in bright colors with dramatic quotes, such as heroes emerge only in times of great need. And so here we want to really emphasize these kind of three points on this kind of transformation in the field via this very data centric, data full kind of methodology, um, this kind of um, uh, flattening of meaning and in, in this infrastructural devaluation of labor. The third question we ask is how have certain benchmark data sets become hegemonic or paradigmatic? In this, we've been focusing on an ongoing collaboration with sociologists, the science, Bernie Koch, and Jacob Foster at UCLA, in which we've been focusing on the institutional usage dynamics surrounding benchmark data sets. So we gathered benchmark data set information from Papers of Code, which is a repository developed by Facebook AI Research. It has information on many, if not most, benchmarks used in computer vision, natural language processing, and machine learning at large. So in this paper that we published at NURBS this year on the, in the benchmarking data track, um, we uh, asked three questions. One, how concentrated are machine learning tasks can be used on specific data sets? And how has this changed over time? Two, how frequently though do ML researchers borrow data sets from other tasks instead of using ones created explicitly for that task? 
And then three, which institutions are responsible for major ML benchmarks and circulation? Uh, sorry, I lost my notes. <laughs> okay, we have her turn. And the first, uh, and I'm focusing on it, I'm going to focus on, 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 on this question individually. And the first result, we see that actually there's a concentration of the usage of benchmarks writ large over time. Certain benchmarks actually have more and more usages. And so what we developed was this beta regularized um, regression, uh, which we estimated um, the Gini coefficient. Um, and if you're not familiar with Gini, it's a, it's a measure of inequality. More, the higher the Gini coefficient is, the more inequality is. If you, one person has all, you know, a perfect one means that one person ha would have all the wealth in a, in, a, in a nation or in a population and the rest would have none. Uh, a, a Gini coefficient of zero means it would be perfect, perfect equality. So we actually see when we subdivide into different different subfields between computer vision, NLP, and then methodology, is that we actually see this increase across most different categories, across the whole data set um, that we got from papers of code, and that the um, usage of benchmark is actually becoming more unequal across time. You can see this in the top, split out by different uh, these different fields. Although we do see this de decrease in NLP. Well, we see this with the violin plot, we see actually see this um, increase and tend towards more concentration um, for the last year in our data set, which is 2020. We also wanted to see how much different fields borrowed from this, um, borrowed from one task to use another task. And this is important because one of the implications of this is that if a benchmark data set was used to assess something for one task, and then was borrowed for another task, it might not actually be suitable for that task. If you're doing something, for instance, for image classification, but then use the data set for image generation, it might not be suitable for that. We've actually seen this being published on within machine learning more specifically, in which um, uh, computer scientists, um, colleagues we had at Google, or I guess I had at Google, but other people on the paper uh, still have at Google, uh, Alex Damore, Kat Heller, we're looking at this as under specification. Basically, things that you were testing on benchmark data sets were performing absolutely awful when applied to real world settings. And so we actually see this strategy of borrowing different uh, adoption and borrowing um, different and different subfields. So uh, we calculated two ratios uh, one, an adoption ratio, and two, a creation ratio. An adoption ratio specifies how much. Um, actual um, uh, subfields uh, went ahead and adopted tasks and benchmarks for different tasks. We actually see this happening uh, a lot in computer vision, not very much in natural language processing, and a lot in methods. And then uh, the creation ratio is how the rate at which different um, different benchmarks are actually being created. And so we actually see this actually high across time, but natural language processing again is a sort of uh, outlier here. And we can sort of talk about why that is in the q and My kind of armchair theorizing is more because there's a much more true to form sort of um, root in uh, specificity of task in data sets uh, in natural language processing, which I think comes from kind of being rooted in linguistics. And then lastly, and this I think is kind of the most interesting part of this paper is actually finding that the, the concentration of um, where these data sets come from um, in um, uh, institutionally. And so what we did is we linked um, authors in these, of these data sets to um, their Microsoft academic records. And we actually find this concentration that happens here in which there's actually been two results here. One is that there's been increasing concentration of data set usage on institutions and data sets across time. Um, you can see this map that shows that a map of the, the kind of size of the amount of data set usages per institutions. And then the color of the dot is if the institution is a nonprofit or an academic institution, or the blue is a, if it's a corporate actor. Most notably 12 institutions accounted for over 50% of the data set usages and benchmarks. All but two were American, one was German and one was Chinese. 
And so these are names that you know, Stanford, Microsoft, Princeton. Uh, I'm actually a bit surprised we don't see this result, um, a Canadian result here um, with, um, with uh, 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 Mila or, or um, University of Montreal um, or University of Toronto um, in the CIFAR data set. Um, but, but we can talk about that later. Um, and then moreover on the right, we actually see there's an increase in concentration on both um, the data set usage as well as the institution usage across time. So there's more concentration of these institutions. So, you know, we get almost to eight, you know, 85% gene inequality in the year 2020, which is quite concerning. The implications of this is that our development in machine learning might be very concentrated in only a few institutions creating this. And there's a sort of mapping effect that stems from this certain institutions are going to get richer. Um, the rich ones are going to get richer, while other ones are going to lag and, and benchmarks, which might be more applicable in real world settings, might reduce bias, are getting ignored. Um, the last question we want to address are kind of what our current work practices, norms and routines that structure data collection, creation, and annotation. Um, and this is something we haven't explored yet, but what we plan to do is interviews with data set creators and developers and also some multi-sided ethnography at certain kinds of um, 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 big AI labs, including a few in Canada, um, Toronto, Mila, and Vector, as well as um, big lab, labs at Stanford and NYU. Um, to conclude, um, the broader implications of this work is that we really want to expand the frames of challenges allowed to algorithmic fairness. The name of this talk is Beyond Bias, because I think a lot of what we get around talking about this is bias. These systems don't work for these particular kinds of people. They perpetuate this. They can lead to allocative and representational harms. Yes, that's all true. And at the same time, those kinds of solutions get chalked up to not having enough representative data. Um, and we want to contest what that means because having enough representative data is a very limited frame on which to, to base our challenges. In the case of ImageNet, after the publication of Excavating AI, um, the ImageNet team published a response um, in which they removed or assessed the imageability of particular types of images and remo removed the offense of person categories. They also focused on diversifying the person people in the data sets. So it wasn't focused on a particular type, making it white, uh, white and male. We applaud these efforts. I think it's important to, to, to realize that. In our conversations with the creators of ImageNet, they've actually been really receptive to the kinds of criticisms that we've raised here. We also want to note that one of the challenges to doing this is that we really want to give insights into why certain classifications exist, and who they serve, and who holds the power to classify. As people that are invested in this kind of technology space, uh, we really need methods to show um, how people show their work and also bring the light motivations, routines, and norms of creating classifications and annotations. Why are you doing such a thing? What is it? What kind of power structure this does it serve? And should it exist to begin with? And to conclude, um, a quote from a, our paper, we focus and we say, when focus, focusing on transparency with the goal of showing the internals of a system, Without plausible actions of being able to change the aspect of the system where fear of victory. So we suggest centering contestability instead. And I think here, and I would I'd like to, you know, kind of revise this statement a little bit because I think what this means a little bit is it really matters here on our regimes of data governance. It really matters to start thinking about who owns these data sets, who's controlling them. And what would it mean to actually have a much more um, kind of AI science based in the public interest? Um, yeah, and I'll leave that there because I think it's a good, good place to launch from, especially as I start at DARE, <laughs> which is very much oriented towards that. So with that, I wanna thank a few people, my collaborators, Emily Denton, Razan Emeranesi, Andy Smart, Larry Nicole Morgan, Klaus Charman, Bernie Koch, David Poster, Jamil smith -Lab. To meet you, on the Zalavar and Meg Mitchell. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hannah. That was fantastic. Thank you for helping us 
move our conversation beyond just bias. For people who are attending, I want to remind you that you're welcome to ask questions in the Q&A box below, and we will take turns reading them aloud. So please write your questions there. There's no questions yet, but I'm sure people are typing away. As people are typing, um, maybe I can kick off the Q&A period. Uh, so it actually goes to kind of some of the final things that you were talking about, about the regimes of data governance. And I'm wondering from your perspective, I mean, perhaps there'll be a multi-pronged approach, but what you think some of the solutions would be? Is it pressure from academic conferences to require some of the changes of like ethical statements, or is it on an institutional level or a governmental level? Or how do you see um, moving towards kind of the public interest aspect of data governance? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question, right? And it's sort of all of the above, right? One of the problems with it is, you know, that there's a, an incentive structure that's oriented towards doing a lot of model development. And, you know, if you're looking at machine learning, uh, machine learning conferences um, more generally, you, you know, you are basically trying to find the most, um, um, you're trying to come up the most kind of clever algorithm, right? And even people who are kind of mainstays in the community have really said, this is really limiting the ima imagination of what happens. Jeffrey Hinton in an interview with Wired a few years ago basically said, you know, you have to have this weird table in your in your paper and whoever, you know, you have to show that your algorithm is the best of most. You know. So he's saying it from the perspective mostly of we kind of are, you know, we've reached a sort of limitation in what we're doing. It's mostly been engineering and less science. And so there's kind of a recognized problem with that. Um, but there also needs to be this intent of, of really thinking about what it means to have data sets that work for people. And, and one of the things that I'm, I was really happy to see at NERPS this year is that there was actually this data and benchmarks track, which is sort of an internal community response to it. Much of this, I think, however, has sort of re remained at a particular um, in a particular vein, I think this has only kind of been receptive for particular communities like natural language processing. Whereas I think the kind of things also be pushed at in subfields like computer vision, in which I think this is, you know, has hugely um, huge implications. I mean, computer vision and these kind of technologies like object recognition, especially in certain this discussion of facial analysis and human subjects. Um, I mean, there's a bigger discussion around whether we want facial analysis. As I said, facial recognition to me is, is, is unless you have very, very strict guardrails around it, not a technology that I would, would want to see in the world. Um, but yeah, and so that's one thing. The other kinds of things are moving incentives, you know, on, I think, national level from a, from a scientific environment. Um, you know, and I think a lot of it's, it's sort of hard to even think about what that would look like and what the different models are. There's a kind of possibility of having some consortium model of data sets, um, which are much more applicable. I'm um, thinking about this coming from the linguistics point of view. There is kinds of um, linguistic repositories in which individual institutions buy into. Thinking about like the linguistic data consortium has such a thing. There's also kind of a, a aspect of this with um, genetic data. Um, um, the gene, I think, the, the Human Genome Project also also has that um, kind of holding holding steady a lot of the issues with genetic research that's emerged. Which you know, but but as a model, maintaining and stewarding the data, and then I think also having you know federal you know federal infrastructure for that, um, I think is also important. Where we need to actually have support. Um, for certain data sets that, have, that were coming from an ostensibly democratic, democratically governed kind of institution, right? Um, so you had a public data set or, uh, or something like a public data trust, um, you know, that was either governed under something like a, a, a National Institutes for Science and Technology of the US. Uh, I don't know if the equivalent is in, the, is in, is in Canada, um, but having some kind of federal oversight on, on that or some kind of federal sponsor. Um, 
you know, so I think there's different ways. I don't think there's one, you know, one approach on that. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'll read a question from Ryan. So Ryan writes, I'd love to hear Dr. Hannah's thoughts about ethics of data governance, research ethics, and public-private research in light of the recent news about the crisis text line, data sharing, and AI. And then they thank you for the talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's you're hitting the nail on the head there. I mean, the crisis text line problem. I think there's layers of issues that come with that, right? I mean, crisis text line is not a public institution, or it's a nonprofit institution. And has that layer of privacy, right? And I mean, I think there was a huge failure there of the kind of release or the use of those data for training models and, and, and basically the use of those models to train other types of um, technologies like chatbots for responding to customer service. I mean, that should be, I think, full stop. Um, uh, um, really an ethical. Um, violation and um, you know I, I I haven't worked in the field of mental health um, but the kind of people that I've been following uh, Kendra Albert had a great thread on that talking about kind of you know the respect for the labor of people who are counselors and also people in their times of greatest darkness um, and and what you how you steward those data right uh, I'll say like flat out what, you know, like what they did was wrong. I thought the response from Dana Boyd uh, was really not sufficient, uh, you know, or, um, you know, I, you know, I, and, 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 and I thought it was very, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was very objectionable. And so I, I, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty upset with that. When talking about nonprofits, I mean nonprofits have their own. Um, they have their own boards. They have their own governance structures. You know they are um, subject to a different set of uh, regulations. Um, but I mean, you know, like I thought it was a pretty big um, breach of trust. However, um, yeah, I mean that's what I can say on that. Um, Thank you. Um, I really encourage people to keep typing in questions. Um, I mean, maybe because your presentation was so thorough, <laughs> they feel like you touched on a lot of the questions. But one thing that you had mentioned in your talk that you want to be able to discuss more time and space allowed was to talk about the Turk, uh, Turk Opticon work campaign. So maybe while we're awaiting more questions, if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, I'm gonna definitely plug this and do I have access to a chat or anything here? <laughs> we, have the, we have the chat closed because that's where a lot of the Zoom bombings okay. happen, but I'm happy to share things with participants after in the email. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so I wanna give a shout out, um, huge shout out to, um, to the kind of uh, campaign that, um, that Turk Opticon is doing. So Turk Opticon, for y'all who don't know, it's uh it started as like a um, like a forum for people um, for crowd workers to connect um, uh, to push back against um, against abuses uh, that Amazon built into the system, um, and they launched a campaign last year both in terms of um, trying to support their organizing and bring on full-time organizers or at least um, organizers that they could be compensated as well as um, building community around, around it. And so uh, they recently had a campaign um, to, um, uh, to push Amazon uh, to um, not allow, uh, let me try to say this correctly, to not allow um, universal rejections. Um, and the Tech Worker Coalition had this great interview with um, Sherry, um, uh, who's uh, their lead organizer. Um, let me find the newsletter. <laughs> um, and let me give you a better, um, better sort of like name of the newsletter so you can search it yourself. Uh, um, and um, let, me, let me find this because I want to get it right so y'all can. Um, Y'all can y'all can search it. Um, 
do, 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 do. not finding it. But the, um, oh, here it is. Issue five, living in the hidden realm of AI. Um, and so one of the, one of the things they've been organizing is under mass rejections, the idea that an individual requester can do mass rejections of prior work um, and to actually push, you know, push Amazon not to allow that and to actually give workers, um, you know, actually to, to pay um, for all the work they've done, even if they, they, don't, they don't accept it, you know, so this, this puts um, this puts a lot of the existing infrastructure puts a lot of, how, of power into the requesters, um, but really doesn't um, give sufficient power to the workers who are doing that annotation. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Carrie, would you like to ask the next question? Yeah. So we have a question from Indira. They write Thank you so much for the fascinating talk, Dr. Hannah. Curating data sets requires financial resources and research, as resources are concentrated in the hands of a few institutes. There is a rising inequity in who can contribute data sets with researchers from the global south left behind. Do you have thoughts on how we could create better funding paradigms that could support people with fewer resources in creating data sets, especially those data sets that represent them? For example, non-English data sets? Yeah, thank you, Indira. I mean, it's so good to hear from you. I mean, like that's this is such a great and difficult question, right? I mean, like, what is what are ways that you could actually push this kind of distribution and move this move these things, um, you know, out of out of the West? Um, you know, I think I really think you know, along with the kind of challenges and moves to make you know make efforts and need to fund these develop you know these these kinds of open resource competitions or these open data set um, tracks i mean we also need money <laughs> we need money i think that money needs to come from from um needs to come from large companies um you know and trying to push them into it i mean that's but actually having Push, pushing towards that is, you know, you also need to push people, push them into that. You need a movement to actually get get the get that to happen. And you know, what's what's the model of change to actually make that happen and actually to to make those demands. Um, there's been some good community efforts um, around natural language processing data for sure. Um, uh, Masakami uh, is a um, uh, let me. I have the paper here someplace. <laughs> Masakani uh, is a is a quote unquote lower resource language um, collective. And it's oriented towards um, African languages, but like, how are you gonna like get those more financially stable? I also want to get a shout out to the effort you're associated with uh, at um, um, uh, Open Wiki Data, um, and and that's. Um, and the effort from um, uh, from whose knowledge around trying to provide some more resources for for under resourced languages um, and under you know under I, I don't like to say I mean the language around this is so problematic under resourced or you know or and it, because it's already starting from this deficit framing right and I don't like using it this is often but I mean the the kind of framing around you know um, those languages and regions which have not been over resourced. I like I like to take this um, framing that Bruha Benjamin takes in Race After Technology, where she's calling the, the Western frame as the overserve, you know. Um, so um, those that's the state sticky questions getting at the money, but I mean redirecting the money that exists from those that have it, I mean it's, it's a super important thing. Um, pushing and making demands on institutions that disproportionately have resources. Thank you. Uh, Sonali writes, any questions about whether the explosion of TikTok content internationally could change how data are mined for machine learning? And they also thank you for your amazing resignation letter that you posted today on Medium. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I don't know a lot about TikTok. Uh, I, I'll, I'll admit I have a, a bit of an ignorance about TikTok. Um, I, you know, kind of 
in, in passing know that there was a lot of discussion of governance around access to the TikTok data um, by the Chinese state. Um, you know, I, I think you know, the more and more we have these apps, which, you know, I mean, doing things about kind of cross national data governance regimes is very, is very sort of difficult. Um, I, I actually heard that, um, I haven't read it in detail, but the Chinese data governance document, I think had a bit of kind of these concerns around data subjectivity that was, that was actually kind of attentive and it was more like GDPR. Um, but I, I just don't know enough about TikTok or the kind of governance regime to like speak in any way that won't be construed as like, I'm pulling this out of thin air. <laughs> and so it's concerning, I will say that, um, and the sort of push on data governance regime, regimes unfortunately has to sort of be taken by depending on your national or supranational governance regime, right? Um, so the U.S. is definitely hella far behind, as well as Canada. Um, but um, you know, I, I think there are some lessons that we can sort of take from those from those places. Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Would you like to? Yeah, you are in the group. So we have a question from Rohan. They write, "Fantastic talk, Dr. Hannah. I personally find it difficult to push back against the use of benchmarks among my peers because it is such a universal practice." What do you think individually we could do to highlight the harms and what alternatives could we recommend? Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question, Rohan. I mean, I think as individuals, it's hard to do things individually to change practices and you need to find collectivities, right? I think one thing you could do, I mean, if you're working within a research group or you're working with a, within a lab, one thing that I think could be helpful is to point, um, point to alternatives to benchmarking as practice. A few people have written on this. Um, one, one I, I'm gonna point to my own work on this, the paper that I covered up with uh, Debraji, and then Olin Palata, and Lee Dunder, and Lee Denton, called AI and the Whole Wide World Benchmark. In the appendix of that, we sort of point out the kind of problems with general benchmarking and, and kind of uh, you know assess like a few different alternatives to it. We have a few citations in there, which could be you could follow as well. Um, but the people have suggested other kinds of alternatives, including evolution, um, evolution studies, um, um, error analysis, um, uh, error suites uh, as alternatives, kind of benchmarking practice. I know it's going to make it a lot harder to publish on things like that um, because of the kind of standard, especially in, in mainstream um, computer science conferences. But I mean, benchmarking is a practice that I think even people who are mainstream within uh, the discipline are, are having a, uh, are kind of pushing back against. So I recommend that and I would recommend reading those papers in collectivity rather than reading them by yourself. Um, I think having a practice of a collective is just a really powerful move uh, and a way to really change behavior. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that was the last question in the Q&A and I also want to be mindful of your time since it's also been such a big day for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you again for being part of this series. Thank you so much, uh, Alex Hanna. Thank you, Fenwick, for co-sponsoring. Thank you, Carrie, for wearing the tech. Thank you, Kim, for doing the captioning. And thank you all for coming to our event. So we're going to be on a pause for a little while, but you can check out videos, the past recordings. A lot of the people that Dr. Hanna mentioned, like Deb Raji, Ruha Benjamin, uh, Mimi Anuaha, and more. Um, Meredith Whitaker, they all spoke as part of the series. So if you want to check out recordings of their talks too, I encourage you to do so. And thank you, everyone. We really appreciate all of your support. I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.